Welcome to the LSL podcast. I'm Derek McKenna and I'm joined as always by Andy McNulty. Andy, how are you this week? A little bit under the weather, Derek, so apologies to the listeners listening a day uh, late as usual, but uh, apologies for that. It's all your fault. The the bam flu kicked in. <laughs> oh, stop doing it, I am. <laughs> um, you, you didn't have a game again this weekend. How many, how many um, weekends have you not played out of the last six or seven? I'm afraid to think about it, Derek, because then I know how many midweek games are coming up in um, yeah. April, May time. So <laughs> I'm afraid to think about it. I'll worry about that March or April time. Oh, God. So look, on episode six of the podcast, uh, we'll be chatting to Ed Saul um, around his journey as a coach and whether there's a need for coaches and managers in the LSL to have their badges to progress. Uh, we also have the usual roundup of the big games from the past weekend. Um, we have some news on the transfers, the latest transfers in the LSL. And we also have some cup draw information around the LFA junior and under 19 uh, cups there, plus much, much more. But before we get into all of that, I've been asked by League Secretary Pat Kernan uh, to inform clubs that if they intend to play any friendly fixtures over the Christmas period and that they, if they are the home team, they must request permission from the league. Um, and they can do that by emailing Pat at leinstersenior15 at gmail.com and he can approve it that way. Um, the three days rule uh, notice is required. And if they're the, an away team, they need to ensure that the, the home team has obtained permission. And I know that seems, I, I've been involved with clubs before, or teams before, where people are like, oh, we should require permission to play a friendly. It's all come down to insurance. We've spoken a lot about insurance on this podcast. If, you, if the friendly is not sanctioned by the league, it's, it causes issues with the insurance. Um, and I, I don't think players are covered, essentially, if it's not a league-sanctioned game. Um, so if you are playing a friendly over the Christmas period, it has to be sanctioned by the league in order for it to be, in order for your players to be covered. Um, so that's really important. Um, Andy, we spoke to uh, Ed Saul a little bit earlier on this evening, so I think it might be a good idea if we if we kick off the show by listening to Ed. It's a it's a good long interview, so um, we'll, yeah, we'll have a listen, listen to that now, and uh, we'll be back soon. Ed Saul, welcome to the LSL podcast. Um, I was going to introduce you as League Slip United manager, uh, uh, but you've just stepped down last week. Tell us what happened there, Ed. Yeah, how are you, Derek? How are you, Andy? How's it going? Um, yeah, lads, I think uh, the, the podcast has been brilliant. Fair play to you. I think the world has gone podcast mad, mad hasn't it? And <laughs> it's great to have uh, the LSL uh, grassroots. All of us love the LSL, and it's great, great to listen in, so fair play. Yeah, look, I stepped down from from leagues up there um, last week. Uh, had, a, had a good time. It's a good club, great, great, great infrastructure, great facilities, and um, yeah, we left on good terms. I, I kind of, you know, I'm an ambitious bloke, and I'm very, very ambitious on and off the pitch. And uh, yeah, the, the club kind of, we kind of came to an agreement that um, it was best for both parties to to move on. And um, I decided in my head maybe. Maybe about four weeks ago that I was going to I was going to leave at Christmas and kind of give the club time to get a manager in, and that's what I've done. Um, yeah, it's the, on the pitch. The the two teams are doing well in good position, and compared to where when I took it over, it was kind of I think we had twelve people on our first night of training for two teams, and now there's there's three teams competing in the LSL, and uh, yeah, whoever takes it over, and um, you know I wish them all the best. Yeah, you, you've certainly left them in a good position, and uh, obviously you you are you're doing quite well with them this year. Um, be- before Ed, we we get into a discussion on on coaching badges, which was was the reason we invited you on um, today. Tell us a little bit about what what you were like as a player. Uh, I suppose I was committed, uh, very committed. I was I played a decent schoolboy level. I was a, a decent home farm team. And then, to be honest, I probably made a mistake, like a lot of young people do. You go playing with your mates, and that was kind of a mistake. Um, I didn't really take it too serious then. Um, ended up then at, at Patsy Y in Ring's End, where I ended up staying for nine years. And uh, yeah, I, was, I wasn't the best player. I wasn't the worst leader. I was probably somewhere in the middle. I gave 110% and won a lot of honours with Patsy Y over the years. and, and uh, yeah, it was kind of. I've been at LSL level since I'm 18, and I'm still at LSL level well up until last week. So every season, I've always been at a team in the LSL. So 
I suppose, on the season campaign or in the LFL leagues, for sure. <laughs> And did you ever play for anybody other than Patsy Boy? I know, obviously, you're a local Ring's Ed lad. Did you, did you ever uh, kind of yeah. uh, yeah, play for anybody else? The, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, at the LSL as well. I played with Ring's End Rovers as well. Um, again, playing there. We, we we had a good Saturday side, to be honest. And uh, we won a lot of things there. And then I moved on to Patsy Boy, where I spent, as I said, nine years as a player, coach, physio, manager, water bottle carrier, you <laughs> name it committee member I've done everything down there and are you still involved down in Patsy Boy at any level obviously you, you, you were you were with different clubs since but is there ever an interest to go back down there is that your, your local club as as in would you consider them your club yeah well like I was born in Rings End and lived in Rings End until I was 28 years of age 29 years of age and then Moved over the other side of the city to Ballyferma, and that's that's where I remain now. But um, I'm still all my mates are still down in in Rings End, and I still go down there for a point and see all the lads. And I know there's great rivals between Patsy Roy and Liffey's. I know all the Liffey's lads as well. Like the Liffey's manager John John Young, I played under him. What a manager he was! And just as we're talking about coaching badges, like. John Young doesn't have any coaching badges and he's won an Intermediate Cup and an FEI Junior Cup so it just shows you that it can be done um, but yeah no I played played under some really good managers at Patsy Roy and uh, as I said yeah I, was, I still keep in contact all the time I, I actually played against them this year uh, for least it was a one-all draw so yeah no, we do keep in contact so, so uh, taking it back a bit, how did you eventually get involved in coaching? Was it originally with Patsy Boy? What sparked the interest there for you to get involved in coaching? Well, I got a serious injury when I was 28 and I had to make a decision whether to go back playing or go on the coaching ladder. So, yeah, I was, out, I was on crutches for five months and you kind of lose a little bit of interest and I was getting married the following year. And I just decided to pack in the football side of it and not go back playing. And Patsy Roy asked me to do yeah, three teams at the time. And as I said, I was only 28, 29. And he said to me, do you want to start with the, with the tour team? And uh, it'd, be, it'd be good experience for you. So that's, that's what I did. I started with the tour team myself and Paul Andrews, another good friend of mine down there. And we won the league. And we, we, we got to a, got to a cup final. We beat in the final. And Around March time of that year, I think it was 2000, it was 2000 and, it might have been 2012, 2014, um, the first team manager, Patsy Woody, had left around uh, March time and I was still managing the tour team and it was, it was kind of a bit all over the place at the time. It was, a, it was a bit of a shock and the players asked the committee to to ask me to come on board as first team manager. So, as I said, I was only managing the tour team, so it was a massive step up. Step up, but we did it anyway. Myself and Paul looked after the two teams. We looked after the tour team and the fourth team, and it was great experience um, at that young age to be getting straight into intermediate level management. And we actually went through it through around in the FEI Cup, and we got to the final of the Metro Cup. We went through three rounds of that, where we eventually lost an extra time to Wayside Celtic in the final. So. After that, the you know I obviously had a had the bug, had the feel for it, and I had no coaching qualifications at this stage. I had no badges done, and the club um, kind of put out feelers um, applications to, to, for management. And I obviously told the club, "Listen, we're after getting to the metro final. We're going through around the FEI. I want I want some of this." But they, in fairness to the club, they uh, they kind of you know. They were looking for someone a bit more experienced and they asked me, look, to stay involved and, and learn me trade a bit more instead of going full in uh, for the season. But um, I didn't stay around. I I left I left them and said, look, I, I, we live on good terms as well. And I think they got Stephen Gagan in at the time. So that's when I decided, right, you know, go out and get your coaching badges, start walking up the ladder. And that's what I did. I, I started at the ladder and I actually started doing my first coaching badge with LSL's Gavin Fleming, actually, believe it or not. <laughs> and he was on he was on my first coaching course and a senior intro course. And even at that I learned I learned quite a bit. And then you, you kinda 
right, what's your next what's your next step? I think I, I went to Pegasus St. James, Jane, just doing a bit of coaching there and managing. Um, then I've done my B licence. I've done my youth cert, sorry, apologies. The youth cert I was then. Um, done that with Mark Kenny and Crumlin. You're another lad that you you know, you look up and you, you learn loads off. And then it was the B licence. And the B licence was, yeah, it was fairly intense. And um, was a lot of a lot of commitment, a lot of days off work, a lot of assignments, and um, then I was at Fairhouse Clover, obviously where I spent two seasons as assistant manager, and we we had a good side there, um, not so good in the first year, but the second year we we obviously finished fourth in the league, but we just pipped to the intermediate final in the Aviva by minute, um, obviously uh, they beat us an extra time, so that was great experience and. Then me 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 uh, ambition was to do the A license. Now, when you get to the A license, you have to be committed. You have to make sacrifices because I need the 15 days off work to do it, and it's from nine o'clock in the morning to to nine o'clock at night, Monday to Friday. There's 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 no way. Uh, it's it's very very intense. But what I found, Derek, was that. From the B license to the A license, like when you get to that A license level, you're going up the levels. You really are at elite level at A license. The B license is more geared towards 9v9, as where the A license is 11v11. And, you know, when you're on that, you realize, right, I'm at the top level here. And if you don't put in the graft and you don't put in the work, you're not going to get through it. It's as simple as that. I think it, out of 20 it, sorry to interrupt yeah. sorry yeah. to interrupt there just just on that you you obviously said you're very ambitious so f- mm. from that I'm hearing that uh, you're going to go on and do your A and possibly your your pro license then again but um is mm. is your ambition to maybe get into the league itself um you know you're using you've you've an awful lot of experience there with uh Dance Senior League um but you, you, you often see that a lot of managers in the league, in the Leinster Senior League, kind of are happy to stop at their B because of what you just said there, the commitment and the time and, yeah. and the cost that's invested in that. So is that something that what you're, you're possibly looking at down the line? Well, regards the cost, Andy, like you might be lucky that the club that you're with might contribute towards this, first of all. Um, secondly, what what's your ultimate goal? Is your ultimate goal to get League of Ireland? Mine is. So, you know, I was listening to Ross Carrick's um, interview with you, lads, and what a brilliant interview. You know, absolutely brilliant. And Ross doesn't feel it's, it's necessary to, to, to do your badges. And look, I'm not in a position like Ross that has played 50-odd junior internationals or internationals and international caps and won intermediates and won intermediate cup and won leagues and played under great managers. So... I totally get where he's coming from that you don't need a LSL level. But what if Ross, you know, when he eventually gets, I'm just using Ross as an example, by the way. If if he, you know, gets to the top of LSL level and he gets the call from one of one of his mates in League of Ireland and say, right, Ross, I want you to come to Bray Wanderers or I want you to come to Longford Town, and he hasn't got his badges and he misses out on that job, you know, it's a, it's a kick in the teeth. Um, so you want to my ultimate goal. Definitely go all the way. I have the A license now, and look, the next level is a pro, which is which is fairly fairly yeah, uh, fairly fairly intense and an awful lot of money. So see what happens when it comes to that. I'm in no rush to to go that far at the minute, but definitely yeah, go as far as you can. Keep walking up that ladder, and absolutely keep 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 seeing where they can bring you. Why not? That's yeah, that's brilliant to hear. Fair play to you. Can I ask, just Ed, and um, if you don't mind me asking, what is the co- uh, the cost involved? Because I'm sure there you you'll probably have people listening to the podcast who may be interested in going down the route. So uh, it sounds like there's a huge commitment level involved. Obviously, for, the, for especially at A level where you have to take two weeks off work. But let's say for the for the youth cert and the B, what's the level of cost involved for to get those? I'm not sure what it is these days, Derek. It's um, you know I know I know the, I can only tell you, when I done my B license it was. What was it? Three years ago it was it was over two grand. Now the A license was about three thousand eight hundred, um, and that includes your, you know, your package of your your, um, your analysis, your video analysis as well. It includes that. Um, yeah, it is. Look, a lot of people will say it's a money racket, but again, if you can get a subsidised, great. 
I certainly got. I thought I I love the A license. I thought you know we are getting they are getting the best coaching like from the tutors. Like these are the real people in the FEI now. These lads, the lads who are looking after the underage teams. Jason Dunahill, look at his team there. Did the last few days is already under 15. So like how could you not learn off him? Paul Ozam, uh, Tom Mowen, Irish under 19 manager, Jim Crawford, uh, Irish under 21 uh, coaching staff, uh, Tom O'Connor, senior ladies. Like these were all the tutors, and they were fairly ruthless with you. Like they were fairly ruthless. So you had to be on the ball, and you have to go out there and coach on it on 11 v 11 pitch, watched by all the tutors, watched by all the coaches. So it's 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 fairly it it it's I really enjoyed it and. You, you know, you come off the pitch thinking, oh, did I do well there? And the coach just got just ruthless with you. But they want to get you, they want to get you past um, where you are and they want to get you good. And that's what I found about it, that if, if you put in the walk and make the sacrifices like of doing your assignments at home, like we didn't go on a family holiday last year because I knew the, the time that was involved in it. And I said to the missus, look, we just won't go on holidays this year. And, and she was fine with that. And uh, yeah, no, it's it, it's like we had coaches from Benfica on it. We had coaches from Brazil. Stevie O'Donnell, St. Pat's manager, one of the best League of Ireland players at Rovers, Dundalk. I bounced ideas off him all the time on it. And he became mates with him. And, you know, he was able to put me straight and narrow on a load of things. And you learn those there and you bring it back to your club. That's, that's, that's what I've done anyway, you know. And what is the overall time that it takes? Um, you mentioned, obviously, with taking two weeks off for the A-license, but surely it's not just that. There's, there's obviously a longer time frame leading into you achieving that um, award of the A-license. Well, it was actually 15 days, Derek. Yeah, 15, 15 walking days. 15 walking days it was that you needed off. And um, it was, um, we, I think, it's done it over, over 10 months. So you do, I've done it in three different blocks. So I've done a block of five. Um, a block of five and a block of five, and you have you, you're given your assignments on your on your very first um your very first block, and the time frame is to get them assignments handed in on the USB stick on on your very last day on your one v one meeting with your tutor. That's and they don't tell you there and then whether you've you've completed. See, it's not pass or fail anymore. So people need to remember that it's not it's not a pass or fail. It's have you completed the A license or you haven't completed the A license? If you've completed it, they will send you out an email to let you know that you've completed it and congratulate you and give you a cert. If you haven't completed it, they will tell you that you need to go away and spend more time at your club and you need to you need to work harder on your coaching sessions and then there, there'll be a visit from an FEO tutor out to your club where they will then decide whether you're whether you've passed it or not or completed it or not, I should say. Okay. But um, the assignments, the assignments are the, the assignments are <laughs> like the months long, months long. You have to like I'm, I'm going to be honest. I'm not the best on computers. I never was, and fair play to me, Mrs. She's playing that PowerPoint and stuff like that, and she was able to help me out on that one. And obviously, you, you touched on it yourself around. Uh, obviously, we were speaking to Ross a couple of weeks ago, and he said, um, you know, he didn't feel it was necessary for LSL level. And we put the question out to our listeners as well. I think you might have seen that on Twitter, where a lot of them would have come back and said that they didn't think it was necessary, that a lot of the time it came down to personality at that level. Um, there's two key distinctions that I always look at to the difference between a coach and a manager what would your opinion be of that do you need to be a good coach to be a good manager and vice versa yeah it's a good question and, and when you tagged me on the twitter the other day it was it was good wasn't it like it was a lot of valid valid uh, points coming back and I, I looked at every one of them and most of the lads were spot on I don't think it is necessary for LSL level as I said you know like I'd, I'd love to have the medals like Martin Lochran and Andy Noonan and all these great managers have, but I, but I don't. So you have to go away and, 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 and try and get to their level by doing it your way. Is it the question of a good coach and good manager? Like I've been a system manager, I've been a coach, I've been a manager. Me personally, I'm very hands-on. Um, even, though I was, I was managed, even though I had great staff at Leeds Club, I had two great lads, lads with me. Tyg and Derek and, and, and they were very good but I was very hands on so I'd like to go out and do my own session as well 
and get stuck in. So, good manager, good coach. I'd like to say I'm a bit, a bit of both. I'm very good at a bit of both. That's what I'd like to say. You know, I don't think um, the one or the other. You can either have it or you don't. That's the way I see it. There. Andy, just to ask your opinion on that. Obviously, you've played under different managers down the through the years. Would do you think that a, a manager needs to be a good coach? And 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 what what would your opinion be on that? Um, just speaking from my own experience, I suppose. Um, from what I'm, what I can remember, uh, all barring my first manager, going back a, a, quite a while now, it was he had no badges, and then we had James Keddy, uh, obviously like won everything at League of Ireland level and um, not sure he had the full badges at the time but he was working his way through them um, and then we had Andy obviously for the last seven or eight years Andy um, embarked on his uh, coaching ladder I suppose um, as he was appointed the manager I think he was given at a 31 32 something like that so very young but I've experienced all different types of um scenarios I suppose Andy was still learning the game and he'll admit that himself that he made a few uh, mistakes at the start and um, with lads and um, but from a current point of view I suppose he's happy enough we have Jason Bourne Jerry Mulligan and um, we had coaches in the past where he Andy's happy to come up on a Thursday or on a Tuesday and let the lads just do a session now he's happy to step in if he sees something going to miss as well he's he's not shy in doing that yeah. But he also trusts the lads to do that as well, which I think is a good sign of a good manager and a good coach. So what I would say Andy probably has amongst everyone else is that he's brilliant with man management. He knows the, the buttons to push for each lads. Um, and that's what I've experienced. He he gets the right reaction out of players that might be struggling in form wise or might be down in the dumps Ed I'm sure you speak you can speak a little bit more on this as a manager you experience all sorts of excuses all sorts of issues all sorts of personal issues from players and you have to sort of deal with that not just the the 90 minutes on a Sunday unfortunately and that's where you have to kind of um, adapt I suppose in my opinion yeah I agree with you 100% Andy like when you look up Blue well they have, you know, you've got Andy Noon and you've got Jason Bourne, are to be one of the best strikers in the League of Ireland. You look at Moctis, they've got Glenn Crow, are to be one of the best strikers in the League of Ireland. Crumlin United have Mark Kenny, one of the best midfielders ever to grace League of Ireland, you know. So the top three teams, I know I'm missing some, but the top three teams that are there in the in the LSL have unbelievable coaches in place. And that's that's massive, to, to, you know, to the likes of Andy Martin. And, and Brian, they can get on and manage, as you said, Andy. They, they definitely, but other clubs aren't in that. You know, don't have that um, situation where they, they wouldn't have that caliber of, of of coach there. Well, you're right, Andy. Times times are changing. Like oh my God, the excuses we get as managers these days is is crazy, absolutely crazy. You you have to prepare yourself for anything to be a manager at, at any level at, at senior football. But especially at the, the intermediate, at the intermediate levels where the pressures are, are higher, um, I don't think players are as committed these days as they were when we were playing. I definitely don't think they are. Um, don't I get definitely think there's a mentality. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely think there's a mentality change with players. Um, like if if like I used to, I used to plan me, me months in advance. I wouldn't go across and watch a game of Celtic or whatever because I fear of losing me place or. Or losing me jersey, but I think lads these days is just if if the missus want them to go away, they'll go away. If they're going away with the lads, they'll go away, and they'll happily fight for the jersey when they come back. And that's what my certainly knows over the last yeah. year. Yeah, and that's at and the I top level at LFL as well. Hundred percent, Ed. And what we've seen, I suppose, yes. um, during our more successful seasons, if you want to call it, from twenty fifteen onwards, that's where sort of Andy had learned from his past experience and we went out and we built yeah. a strong squad so for instance if we were missing our regular starting centre forward or right full or whatever it may have been we had a, a more than ready um, backup you know and we've we've had probably over the last five or six years really really strong squads where you know you wouldn't really notice a replacement which I think is 
is something that also needs to be factored in as part of a manager's role as well. I think if you if you rely on your bare eleven, you're going to have stags. You're going to have like especially yeah. after Christmas, the amount of people that are going to say, "Oh, my missus got this surprise uh, thing. We're going to Rome for four days and we're missing." And then you have lads like often, often I've heard of people taking um, week holidays at the first week of June, last week of May and first week of June, where if you've yeah. played in the Lancer Senior League, you know cup finals are then. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, it's just absolutely. frustrating and stuff like that. Yeah, it's the it's it's challenge that, they, that the managers face on a, on a daily basis. And as you said, players players are looked for the, you know, the, the cheap holidays in May or, or what drives me mad is the cheap holidays in September where you're, you're only starting the season as well and you've players going away left, right and centre. And, you know, you have the midweek games as well. So players could be going for two weeks holiday or 10 days. So they could miss three to four games because of the, because of the midweeks, the way it works. Oh, it drives you mad. Yeah, but at the same time, I think there's also an acceptance there now. You, you hit the nail on the head. I think there is a culture change. Um, I think yeah. managers have had to adapt. I'm sure some of the old school managers have seen the transition, like Martin and Peter Lennon and, and John Young, as you mentioned earlier on, have probably seen these changes over decades nearly. You know, the, the, those guys are managing 10 plus years. And I, I'd say they can see it because I remember starting back uh, 10 odd years ago and you never missed training, you never booked a weekend away, you told the missus, listen, every Sunday, the odd Friday, I'm going to be missing, just rule them out, I'll let you yeah. know if we have a weekend off, and then we can organise something, and that was more or less it, now, that commitment isn't there, I don't think. No, it's not, no, but as you said, it's, it, it's something that you just have to get on with, and you have to deal with, and that's that's the joys of, of having a big squad, if you can cope at them times, um, with players going away but it is it, 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 it was probably beating me up when I first got into management but as, as you said you, you, you kind of start learning for it, from it now and at the end of the day lots of amateur players aren't they so you gotta, you got to take that into consideration as well Ed, Ed can, yeah, I ask, can I ask you just around uh, what you've learnt on, obviously, uh, up as far as A-licence now. I was listening to a really good interview with Paul O'Brien, I think it was over at uh, Sacred House, Fair House Clover at the moment, uh, on the Mixer podcast, and he was talking about the kind of level of professionalism that he's trying to implement at, at that club. Um, how have you implemented what you've learnt at the clubs you've been at? Uh, video analysis would be one. Um, straight away I actually done my B licence with Paul he's a, he's a good friend of mine um, we work together as well um, he's, he's a good lad and he's he's currently on his A licence and yeah video analysis Derek would be, the, would be the big one because you have to you have to you have to video all your training sessions at A licence level so you constantly have a camera on you watching what you're doing and you have to video your matches as well so what you have to do is you have to video your match and you have to do a match analysis based on that match. And then what you have to do is you've got to put on a training session, a proactive or a reactive training session based on that match. So if you if you wanted to, you know, if, if you won more nil um, or you were beaten more nil, you know, you, you decide whether you're doing defending or an attacking session. And that has to be videoed as well. But what I did at least it was we uh, we used to go into the, into the shop and we used to watch clips of the, of, of of the game, um, show lads on the pitch. You can you can highlight uh, players on the pitch and show them where they went wrong. And it was an eye opener. It was an eye opener to the players to say, right, look, you weren't tracking back here. You weren't in your position. What are you going to do to correct that in the next game? And then you're hoping that the players will look at that and they'll bring it into the next game. And we got great success out of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, did you feel? The did you feel they bought into that? It. Uh, yeah, I felt big time, Derry. Yeah, Andy. Yeah, big time. I, I felt he did um, last year. We, you know, we're a much stronger squad last year at League than I did this year, to be honest. And I think we're just talking about players going uh, commitment there. Like I've lost three players, three key players to traveling. They're gone. They're gone traveling, and that's just you know that's something that you you just have to deal with, I suppose. But yeah, last year video analysis shown players. Um, the proactive and reactive and, and where where to improve and and then going out onto the pitch and and and, and implementing it yeah but you had the vi- you had the camera on you all the time so the lads got used to me videoing them and 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 showing them stuff and 
I feel, I feel it, it, it. If you have the manpower, you have somebody there. If you have the staff, if you have the facilities, it's a no-brainer. It, it'll definitely take you on uh, level. There's no doubt about it. It'll definitely take you on level. I was just going to ask about that. Is that one of your assistants doing the video in there, or what way does that work? Yeah, we do. I had it. I had it. One of the assistants doing the video. Um, he he would. You can get a GoPro, but we had a, a camera up at Leakslip, and he used to follow me around, and he'd, he'd watch me, and basically then I'd watch it back and make sure everything was all right before you you send it into the FAI. And um, but yeah, your a license, you you have to do all video all your games, all your all your training sessions, and but you need help, Derek. You, you and Andy, you need help. You can't do it. You can't do it on your own. You need somebody to help you, and your staff to help you. Um, Ed, you mentioned obviously um, looking to get towards League of Ireland as the kind of ultimate goal. Um, and I think myself and Andy were were talking about before we came on the podcast this evening. Um, I know you're a big Rovers fan, and there's talk of them um, kind of potentially going into the into the fourth division. Well, what's what's your opinions on that in, in terms of if you can take yourself away from being a Rovers fan uh, as a football fan in general? What do you think of the idea of, of Rovers um, entering a second team in the fourth division? Well, Rovers won in the fourth division a few years ago, and I don't remember a big song and dance about it like there is now. It seems to be every, everybody bar Rovers fans seem to be against it, but it didn't seem to be like that a good few years ago, to be honest. The team only finished, I think they might have finished below mid table. Um, but, like, there's what, they're going to have nine teams in the League of Ireland this year. Surely, let another team go in and make it ten, make it, make it, make it a decent league. Yeah, that's like I don't, I don't see why Dundalk don't do it. I don't see why, why Bowles don't do it, Pats don't do it, Derry don't do it. I know Derry enter teams in the Ulster League. I don't know, like having this the League of Ireland is having nine, eight, eight, nine, ten teams. It's ridiculous. The season starts late. They finish early. Um, and then they have to wait weeks for playoffs and stuff like that. It's crazy. I think, you know, the more teams in that league, the better. Um, I would say yeah. it's uh, one of the biggest things probably would be the investment. I would imagine that um, there's all, all been rumours about, you know, um, the likes of Bowles on a, on a low budget throughout the last couple of years. Whether that's true or not, I'm not too sure. But the likes of them probably couldn't afford um, finance a second team because obviously travel... Um, and everything, every other cost that comes with with a, f- a senior team, if you want to call them, so maybe that could be one. Um, Rovers maybe have a, an investment there that they're willing to. In, but I would be as a Rover if I was a Rovers fan, I would be concerned about what your investment versus your return would be. Um, I would like to see that mm. and the plan for that because if it's just there to sort of be there. Then it's useless and it's a it's an expense that you probably could do without. But if if you see six, five or six lads progressing from the B team into the senior team over the course of twelve or eighteen months, then it's obviously worthwhile. And um, you see the amount of lads that leave the league or leave teams at the age of 20, 21, because they're just not developed right or the, their time hasn't come. So I would be just yeah. a little bit concerned about you know the the cost versus the benefit. Would would it, would yeah, there well, be an idea Ed, of of putting? Uh, you mentioned obviously Derry have a the reserve and Finn Harps as well have the reserve teams in the Ulster Senior League. Would it make sense? And I know there's, there's complications in terms of a summer season in the League of Ireland and winter season with the LSL. But would it make sense for all of the the, the Leinster clubs to have a reserve team as such in the Leinster Senior League? Yeah, well, that's, that's something the Leinster Senior League. Uh, the clubs would have to vote on if it ever came to it, Derek. I do agree with Andy. You know, I didn't touch on that point. That it it it, it does come down to cost realistically, doesn't it? I suppose Rovers, Rovers and Dundalk would be financially in a better position than than some of the other clubs. Um, would could could they come into LSL? Would would the LSL clubs allow them come straight into intermediate football? Probably not. Um, they're not going to start at at junior level. They'd have to come into intermediate level, but. Again, that that have to be the club. So, I mean, I, regards Rovers, like you know, a lot of Rovers players go on loan, and um, a lot of the fringe players go on loan to the likes of Braves and and uh, Longfords and Athlones and stuff like that. So, I'd say that stops straight away, wouldn't it? Really, they probably all play for the Rovers B team. 
Um, yeah, I'd imagine so. Yeah, yeah. So that 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 probably wouldn't it wouldn't help other teams in the league. Um, yeah, and you touched on loan moves there, Ed. I think it, it, like if if someone was savvy enough to link up with a top Leinster senior league team, I think we touched on this one of the episodes previous. If say Stephen Bradley approached Andy Noonan um, and said, "Listen, we've got a few lads here that are just on the cusp for the first team. Can we send them down to you? See how they get along." You know, I I just don't think there's enough. Um, there's enough communication between now whether whether they're arsed to do it or not, I don't I don't know, or whether that's something that is completely I could be missing something, but um that's I would be certainly looking at that because Bluebell would benefit, the late Leinster Senior League would benefit. And then if it meant a year or eighteen months later that, that that individual has sort of grown up, matured, and is ready to go into the first team, I I, I can't really see a negative to it, if I'm being honest. Sounds like you're making a pitch no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, in, in all fairness, it, it, the LSL like it's it, it's getting better every year on and off the pitch, isn't it? Like it's it's great. Like in, like I go and watch. It. Like I'm I'm a, I'm a freak when it comes to to, to coaching and football. Like I'll, I'll go and watch all levels of LSL games and and um, I watch the warm ups. I'm, I'm mad. I, I, I want new ideas all the time. I want to pick up new ideas. If, if I'm going to watch Celtic games, I'll go in beforehand watch the warm-ups. If I'm going to Rovers, I'll try and get in and watch the warm-ups. If I'm bringing the dog up the park on a walk, I'll look at the local team, see what drills they're doing and take a few notes and then try and bring it into your, into your own session. I'm just a, a, obsessed with them kind of little things um, with regards to coaching. But yeah, like again... I think the LSL, they're, they're trying to get better and bigger every year. And, and the top half of the LSL this year is so competitive. So competitive. Like, you, can, you can't call a winner. Like, Crumlin, at this stage last year, more or less had the, the league won in December. They were unbelievable, um, unbeatable. And this year, there's about five or six teams. And, you know, when you try and pick a winner out with them. You'd want to be a good better man, i tell you. Big time. Yeah, Big very time. tight. So uh, just to kind of to fi- to finish up, Ed, um, I wanted to ask you, what's next for you? Are, are you looking to get back in- involved in management soon enough? Or are you looking to kind of take a little bit of a break before you get back in? Yeah, Derek, it's, it's been mad. Like, it, um, as I said, I've, I've never, you know, left the team um, halfway through the season before in, in, in my whole career. So it's, it's definitely pastures new to me. And, you know, when the news broke you last week, the amount of phone calls I've had off, managers and text messages and referees and chairmen just asking me what happened and you know wishing me all the best and that's one thing that you know is about LSL like it, it's a massive league and it, but it's a small league at the same time because everybody knows everyone and uh, you know what our managers we we try and um, we try and we're rivals on the pitch and we try and outfought each other and try and try and get one over tactically and stuff like that but you know there's a lot of respect I know I've noticed that since I've left the that the amount of respect between the, the managers off the pitch is great to see and we all want each other to do well at the end of the day. So yeah, Derek, I'm just gonna I suppose Andy I'm gonna enjoy Christmas with the with the family and you know, this week I'm is my fourth week I'm, I'm training and yeah, already the missus given out to me because I'm taking <laughs> over the T V. So uh yeah, I'm just gonna enjoy the next couple of weeks and, and if something comes up in the new year that that appeals to me absolutely, yeah. It's like it, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm open and, and, and see what happens. Make sure it's the best move for me. But yeah, I don't want to be out of football long. I don't want to be out for long. You know, I want to, want to stay active and, and, and keep picking up the new ideas and keep, keep getting, keep, keep working hard on the coaching and stuff. So that, that's it doesn't sound like you're going to be out of the game too long, Ed. To be honest with you, with that sort of CV and the ambition, I would imagine anyone that's listening from any clubs that. Uh, happen to change their manager over Christmas, I would imagine you'll be getting a lot, an awful lot of phone calls. So, yeah, I think um, no, whoever it is is picking up a, a top quality coach and manager there. Well, thanks very much, Andy. Yeah, I like to, as I said, I, I like to get stuck in. And when I yeah, when I go into a club, I'll give I'll give more than a hundred percent. I'll give I'll give a million percent to, to both teams, like Saturday and Sunday teams. It, it, uh, it's what I do, and. Um, Try and try and bring new ideas and, and get the back and, and and try and be successful and uh, yeah it's why we love the game isn't it it's why we why we love the level and and um, to keep plugging away and, and hoping that you get the rewards. Ed, uh, 
we want to wish you the best of luck and, and we look forward to seeing what the next move is. Definitely we'll keep an eye uh, and, and an ear to, to hear what happens next. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's been a pleasure to speak to you today. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, Derek and Andy wish us all a happy Christmas and uh, thanks very much for having me. Cheers, Ed. Okay, so that was Ed Sol there. Uh, again, thanks to Ed for, for taking the time to come on uh, the LSL podcast um, and we wish him the best of luck, uh, whatever the future holds for him. I'm sure, like you said later, there, Andy, in the interview, he, he probably won't be hanging around long and he'll probably be back in a job quite soon. Yeah, very, very impressive stuff. Um, his his self investment and his uh, his ambition is obviously very, very clear. And um, you know, it, it's a, a, it's probably a reflection on Ed himself. The fact that Lake Slip came out and released a statement and was very complimentary of him. So I suppose that probably speaks an awful lot about Ed and uh, the relationship that he had with Lake Slip. So obviously, for one reason or another, it didn't work out. But as I said, I'd, I'd say his phone will be hopping over the Christmas period. Yeah, and you, you could see on Twitter during the week the huge amount of well-wishers he had. Um, and l- like yourself, a lot of people saying that they wouldn't expect them to be out of the game too long. So we'll keep an eye on that and hopefully uh, we'll get to speak to Ed again uh, later in the season. Um, speaking of kind of the, the transfer season that we're in at the moment, um, it's been a bit slow over the last week. It, it, obviously, we had about 70 transfers last week, which we, we could have got bogged down in, Andy. So luckily this week, we, we don't have as many to get through. I think we've only seven completed transfers in the LSL um, this past week. Uh, do you want to take them, Andy, or shall I? Or we, we can split them. There's only seven, so we won't, we won't stumble over them this week. Yeah, I'll go ahead there. Ryan Scully from Kellester Donny Kearney to Airfield United. Mohamed Boudarbala from Palmerstown to Bangor. Martin O'Leary from McKelvey Celtic to Hardwick AF, FC in the AUL. Adam Griffiths from Crumlin United to Kilnamana. Stuart O'Dwyer from Dingle United to McKelvey Celtic. Chris Pollis from Glebe North to Scarry's Town. And Wesley Callahan from Lee Slip to St. John Bosco. So, yeah, not too much action this week. Yeah, and obviously the next time we're on, we'll, we'll give a, a more updated list. You would expect after the, after the Christmas is over with and once we kick off into January, um, you'll start to see those transfers speed up again. You'd, you'll have a, a good flow of them coming in in early January. Um, so... The past weekend, Andy, there was uh, there was a lot of games actually called off, which was surprising to me because I felt that the weather hadn't been as bad in the past week. But it seemed like um, there's kind of the remnants of the bad weather led to a lot of games being called off. But there was, if we if we look at um, the FEI Junior Cup, there was a lot of kind of legacy fixtures that still needed to be played to complete before we get to the kind of last 32 draw. Um, Sheriff YC had a, a 3-2 win against Salt Hill Devon. Uh, obviously, Sheriff, former multiple winners of the competition. Um, there, Tulka Rovers had a huge 7-1 win against uh, Beach Park. Do we, do we have, uh, we don't have the scorers of that, Andy, do we? Or I think it is on their Twitter page for anyone ah. that wants to look, but uh, yeah, forgot to take it down. Apologies, Tulka. <laughs> no worries. Um, but a, a big win there, 7-1 against Beach Park. Um, another big win for Rush Athletic, who are a major Sunday side. Um, I mentioned, obviously, they um, did, I, did I mention last week that they beat Sheriff last week, which was quite a big win? I, I think I mentioned it. Um, but another yeah. win from them, 4-1 against Ratkeel from Limerick. Um, the there was two goals from Brian Gillen, one from Barry McAllister, and one from Jake Kenna, and that's them into the last 32. Um, and Drunkondra as well beat Arthur Griffith Park uh, FC. I think it's AGP FC. Is that Arthur Griffith Park? I think yes, so. 3-1 yeah. uh, three, three win there. I don't have the scorers in that. And then the last one to still be played um, is Ro- the big kind of disputed game was Rosemount Mulvey against VEC, and that's on this Wednesday um, Wednesday the 7th the 18th of December in Pierce Park in Crumlin and I think that's a neutral ground for that one I know there was a bit of a dispute over um, the, the venue the last time um, so that kind of leads to the last the last 32 draw now is Fairview Rangers against John Bosco uh, Cretty Yard versus Glenthorne Celtic Usher Celtic versus Regional United 
Ballinasloe Town or Villa FC versus Rush Athletic. Um, so a nice trip down to potentially either Waterford or Galway for Rush Athletic. Um, you have Doolin's Cow or Valeville Shankill. I think that game was uh, postponed at the weekend. It was a debt um, and condolences to the people of Valeville Shankill. I'm not sure if it was their chairman, but I know it was going to be a club man who was heavily involved there. Um, so that was postponed. But the winner of that game, whenever it's rescheduled, will, will uh, be at home to Westport United. You have Oliver Bond Celtic against Kildrum Tigers. Crumlin United against Kuna United. Sheriff YC, um, who obviously won against Salt Hill Devon, they have uh, Scarry's Town. Um, and then you have uh, Trim Celtic or Avenue United against Drumcondra or Ferrybank. Gordy Rangers against Cashel Town. Greencastle versus St. Michael's. Shannon Hibbs or Tulka Rovers versus Castle Bar. Mull Ulla FC against Atten Roy. Suncroft AFC against Pike Rovers, New Park against Carrick Celtic, and then the winner of VEC or Rosemount or Brunkana Harps, because that one still needs to be played against Killarney Celtic. Um, so sorry if we're repeating ourselves at that draw, but there seems to be um, a lot of the delays this year in getting fixtures played. Um, so hopefully they'll get that sorted out. These toys, the, the, the ones that were kind of just mentioned there, are due to be played on the weekend of the 12th of January. So um, just after the, f- the first weekend, we're back. Are all clubs back on the first weekend, uh, Andy, or is it most of them are back on that second weekend? Um, I'm league, hoping so, think. Derek. I'm hoping so, Derek, just so that we can kind of get an extra game under our belt. But I suppose it really is weather permitting. I think you mentioned earlier on, I think it's a legacy thing. Um, the weather, any sort of rain on top of already heavy grass uh, or heavy muck this year, this week, I'd say, just more or less um, compounded the, the, the misery onto the pitches. So I'd say that's a large reason why um, most games were off this week. Yeah, I think um, the information I was uh, given this week that is that clubs that have all weathers will probably be back on the first weekend of January. And those clubs who don't have all weathers will be back on the, the second weekend. That's the way I understand it. When the kind of public pitches and all that open up. Um, but I'm sure we'll hear more from the league over the next few weeks on what, what those fixtures will be. Um, other big games on over the weekend, Andy. What was any? The, there was a couple of cup games. I think um, the Metro Cup. Did you did you hear about that one? It was a close yeah, game. Yeah, there was a couple of games there. Um, first up was a cracker, Castleknock uh, Celtic two all um, after full time with Kilna Manor. Um, four all then after extra time, um, and the penalty shoot and shootout then went to Kilna Manor. But in that game, Gary McKay, Bex League of Ireland, and Stephen Kinch uh, scored a hat trick. So, yeah, good. A bit of a frightener there for killing the man. But I know Kiss, Castle Locker are, are a team on the up. So, um, yeah, obviously a cracker. Yeah, Castle Locker uh, really impressed me. I think we played them in the first game of the season. Um, and they were a really, really good side. Um, they've kind of, I wouldn't say they've slipped down the LSL Senior 1B table. It's just that they've kind of played less games than everybody else and they're still if they win those games in hand they're still straight back up the table again so a very very strong side I've been really impressed with them good young side as well um, so they obviously gave Killing the Man a little bit of a scare there uh, getting that to four all but Killing the Man and prevailing um, on penalties there there was another good, big cup game uh, in the Cattle Cup um, Liffey's, Liffey Wanderers had a good 3-0 win against Cherry Orchard Aidan Roach, Sam Simpson, and Daniel McGuinness with the goals there for the, the Pierce Street side. So um, I've heard them call the Rings End side before. They don't like to be called Ring End. They're a Pierce Street side. Um, I've, made that <laughs> I've made that mistake myself before. Uh, but the, yeah, so good win for the lads there. They, they seem to be going well this season, Liffies. Yeah, I think um, they can be slightly um, inconsistent, but when they do click into gear, they're a, they're a very formidable team. They're, I think I mentioned them last week or the week before. Sam Simpson is obviously a, a player that's rich in form at the moment. And, you know, they'll be looking to uh, really, you know, increase that coming into the new year. So, yeah, look, they're always a team. They're always very difficult. We always struggle down there. But, uh, yeah, they, they, if, they can, if they can maybe just be a little bit more consistent that they'll be there or thereabouts. And obviously the lads enjoyed their, their Christmas party the other night as well. I think they had a few photographs uh, up outside the, the Podrick Pierce pub on Pierce Street uh, up on Twitter. So they seemed like they were enjoying themselves. 
yeah, it's great to get everyone together over the Christmas and have a few points. You know, it's great, and I think uh, the manager came back and and rightly so said about the the the, the pub putting a few uh, a bit of grub and sorting the lads out with a bit of points. So, you know, that's what it's all about giving back to the sponsors because it's difficult enough to get a few quid in throughout the year. So, it's the least the players can do. Uh, it's just to buy a few points over the Christmas. You know. Yeah, and I know in particular that pub is a big supporter of the club. Um, I remember being back in it after their FAI Junior Cup win uh, a good few years ago and uh, enjoying point, points late into the night in, I think they call it Moroni's, used to be the old name, but it's the Padraig Pierce now. Um, but yeah, good nights to be had in there. Um, let me see. So, uh, Senior Sunday at the weekend. Um, many games have we got? We had three games that survived the weather I suppose there was a couple called off including your own one Andy against Crumlin the El Clasico as I like to call it that one was that one yeah. fell, fell, fell to the weather it seems to be picking up that bit of a, a name alright there's been a few people using that online so yeah it might be something we can look at uh, <laughs> copywriting that maybe <laughs> yeah. yeah it was a pity actually that that one didn't survive because obviously you have, with a game of that so is with, with obviously Crumlin and Bluebell a lot of people look forward to that big fixture each year um, so we look forward to the rearranged fixture whenever it happens in the new year but the games that did survive uh, Minute University Town had a good 3-0 win against Port Marnock Dara Deegan Killian Duffy, who seems to be on fire lately as well. He's banging in the goals left, right and centre. Uh, and Dylan Kavanagh also got one as well in that game. Um, top of the table clash, Andy, was uh, any surprises, I suppose? Uh, Banger against the Moctis, were you surprised by the result there? Um, look, it's the, the way this league has gone, Derek, um, look, anyone can beat anyone on their day. It's, it's crazy. Like You go into these top of the table clashes and, you know... Um, Moctis, by all accounts, played really well. Uh, it was probably comfortable enough in the end. I know Bangor were coming off a, a defeat. I think that's two in a row now. But, like, it's not over till it's over. There's so many more games. Um, you know, Malahoyd beating Colester. There's just so many games. And especially with Crumlin and ourselves not playing, it's an opportunity to sort of rack up a few points ahead of us not playing. You know, we've got games in hand. Uh, it hasn't been the freshest of starts for both clubs but we'll be still there or thereabouts um come the new year you know okay so in that game of a, obviously it was a 2-0 win for Moctis um Alan Bourne and Garrett McCaffrey who who had his 13th I believe 13th goal of the season um for St Moctis so good 2-0 win there um, and then the other game you mentioned, obviously, Malahoy had beaten Clester and Kearney 2-0. Uh, Stephen Chambers and Michael Scott for Clester and Killian Thompson and two from Glenn Daly sealed the win. Um, in controversial circumstances, I believe, that game, they had a, a bit of a disputed goal in that one. Um, so that one finished 3-2 to Malahoy. Um, obviously, Clester uh, disappointed to lose that one at home. Um, in the senior... One, I think there was only one fixture survived in that, and was it is UCD uh, against Glenville. Yeah, UCD uh, beat Glenville four 0 Gavin O'Donovan with with a single goal and a, a Hanran, Hanrahan hat trick. So obviously a good result there for UCD. Yeah, and then in we couldn't find any results in the senior one A, and uh, that may be our fault due to lack of research, or maybe teams fault due to lack of putting the scores on Twitter and um, bit of both maybe but we couldn't find any scores on that so do apologies guys if there was games on the senior um, 1A we just couldn't get them this week um, the senior 1B obviously I have a vested interest in this um, St Francis opened their new Astro pitch up in John Hoyland Park uh, with a 2-1 win um, against Broadford Rovers, Owen Lanigan and Steve Dunn with the Francis goals. They were 1-0 down at halftime, but two goals in the second half uh, secured that win for them. Keeps them in the hunt. Um, they're still 10 points behind Kilbarrick, but if they win their two games in hand, they're only four points behind. Um, Kilbarrick obviously had a good 5-0 win against Verona um, in the first game this season. Uh, we drew... Three all with Verona, very tough game over there in Blanchestown, but um, a fairly comprehensive 5 0 win. Uh, Jason Beasley with two, Alan Morphy with one, Adam Fox with one, and Gavin Fitzsimons. Um, I should say the score probably um, was a bit flatter, and we scored th- three goals in the last 10 minutes. I think it was going to um, kind of put a gloss on that, but uh, it probably wasn't a 5 0 game there, but a good win, and we'll take it all the same. And then um, Hartstown Hunstown had a good 2 1 win against Airfield. And the last fixture there was um, 
St. Kevin's boys against Sportslink, two other teams going to in the hunt for a promotion or the title. And St. Kevin's 1-0, Stephen Cantwell with the goal there. Um, so it's it's all kind of hotting up in the in the senior 1B. Um, like I mentioned, Kabarik, uh, 10 points clear, but there's a couple of teams in the hunt with games in hand. So it'll be interesting to see how that pans out um, after the new year. We've obviously... Um, availed of having an astro pitch this year and having not many games called off so been quite lucky in that sense um a couple of cup draws andy do you want to touch on the the junior cup round four the leinster junior cup do you want to read out a few of those yeah no problem at all um so there was a couple of well there what is still a couple of or ors but i know results of some of the results have come in um so you have newbridge town uh, versus moctis or Colester Donny Kearney, um, Ballybrack FC versus uh, League Slip, Rosemount Mulvey or Newtown, um, or um, Dublin Bus versus Bangor Green Hills Green Park, uh, Skerries or Beach Park versus um, Kilbarrick. Just bear me one second, I'm struggling to get this page. Here we go. Uh, Trim Celtic or Kilnamana versus Albury. I think, did I mention earlier on that that was a, a kill? Trim, trim one that one trim one that one yeah. for one I think so apologies there might be some of these results already in so apologies um, we'll play um, so that would be Trim Celtic to play Albury or Bluebell or uh, Rathout so still a couple of games to be played there uh, Wayside Celtic with a boy and that's the Saturday section obviously and then you also yeah. have the, the Sunday section is uh, Whitehall Rangers or Stella East Wall or Cretty Yard United versus Usher Celtic. You have Baldoyle United against Kilmore Celtic. Good Northside derby there. Um, you have Shamrock Rovers from Wexford um, against Evergreen uh, from Kilkenny. You have Freebooters or New Park versus Glyn Barntown. You have Clon Mullen or Finglas United versus Gorry Rangers. You have North End United against St. Paul's Artain. That actually be a good game. North End against St. Paul's Artain. St. Paul's are flying this season in the senior, sorry, the major one Sunday. Um, I think they might have a 100% record, but I'll, I'll need to check on that later. But they're, they're flying anyway, the top of the league there. And then boys for Oliver Bond, New Oak Boys, Willow Park or Edenderry Town, uh, Court Town, Hibs or Blackrock College have boys. I've never seen that before, Andy, where uh, an or game has a boy. Willow Park or Edenderry Town has a boy in the next round. Yeah, anyway. strange one, yeah. Yeah, never seen that before, but that's the way it reads and that's the draw that was done last week. And then we also had the Leinster under-19 uh, Cup second round draw. Um, and I'm happy to take those. I'll, uh, you have Crumlin United against Free Booters. You have P-Mount United or... Oh, sorry. You have, the way this is done is a little bit confusing. Crumlin United or Free Booters versus Eden Derry Town. Uh, P-Mount United or Finglas versus Shelbourne FC. You have Rohini United versus Home Farm. You have St. Joseph Boys versus Sheriff YC or Selbridge Town. Kilbarrick United versus Castleknock Celtic. Larkview FC versus Greystones United. You have Malahide United versus Draw the Boys. And then the last one on there is Collinstown FC against Wayside Celtic. Games to be played the 1st and the 2nd of February next year. Um, that's more or less it, Andy. A um, couple of mentions, as as always, towards the end of the show. Um, just to mention again, Cardiff FC uh, are hosting a six-side tournament on the 28th. So if you want to get out and run off the turkey and ham, um, you can get in touch with the lads at Cardiff through their face or Facebook or Twitter page um, and enter a team into that. There's a cash prize for the winners. It's 100, 100 euro per team. Um, so get in touch with the lads there. Uh, you have a couple of updates yourself, Andy? Yeah, Derek, thanks. Um, just a big thanks to everybody for the toy, toy appeal. We sent out a couple of weeks ago on one of the episodes and the Mixer podcast and a lot of other teams got involved. So a big thanks to everybody that who has contributed so far. The reaction has been immense online. And to be honest with you, you've made some, some kids very, very happy this Christmas. And I know from speaking to the guys involved in the charity that they're overwhelmed with the reaction. So thanks very much to everybody for um, contributing to that. Um, I also see that the hashtag huddle hug is still going strong over uh, online. So fair play to everybody um, doing that and take care of yourself over the Christmas. It can be a lonely time for some people. So just reach out if you need any help. Um, one of our regular listeners, uh, Derek Beauchamp from uh, Professional Pitch Marking, uh, 
he was tweeting us from the Mogan Mountains when he was tuning in last week. <laughs> yeah, so, for day to Derek, I know he's a bit of a marathon man. So, I hope you're well, Derek, and have a good Christmas. Um, doing great work with the professional pick, pitch marking as well. So, um, that's an unsolicited um, pitch for yourself. <laughs> pardon, the, pardon the pun. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much from from myself. Yeah, um, so I think this will this well no I think this will be our, our last podcast before Christmas, um, so obviously want to list uh, wish all of our listeners bit, bit tongue tied there <laughs> with that wish all of our listeners a happy Christmas, um, and we'll we'll look forward to um, getting back to it again after the the Christmas break. So um, yeah, everybody enjoy your Christmas. You too, Andy. And yeah, we'll thanks very much, Derek. And just, yeah, just before you go, have a very good wedding on the 30th of December. So, best of luck with that and have a great day. Thanks very much. Much appreciated. And yeah, look forward to speaking to you when I get back from the honeymoon. Thanks, Derek. Cheers, Andy. Chat soon.